in Abwandlung eines bekannten Satzes von Karl Valentin zur Kunst könnte man sagen, Preise sind schön, machen aber viel Arbeit. Das gilt insbesondere für den Nobelpreis, auch für manche andere Auszeichnungen, aber für diese glaube ich doch noch mehr. Um dazu Näheres zu erfahren und überhaupt mich über die Bedeutung von wissenschaftlichen Preisen auszutauschen, darf ich nun Eric Kandel, Maybrit Moser und Edward Moser zu mir zum Gespräch bitten. Separating the Moses, it's a dangerous job. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Condell, maybe we can start with you. Uh, winning the Nobel Prize is not quite like winning in the lottery, but I think the element of surprise might be similar. How did you find out that you had won the Nobel Prize in 2000? Uh, I got a telephone call, but if I might, I would like to introduce a little prelude to that. Four or five years before I won the Nobel Prize, Denise and I were at a summer home on vacation, and the telephone rings inside. We were hanging the laundry. Denise is French. She likes fresh hung laundry. So I go inside to answer the telephone. It's somebody from the National Institute of Health that is funding my research. They said, your grant has been renewed, and we think you're going to get the Nobel Prize. I go out, I hang the laundry, and they tell Denise, he thinks I'm going to get the Nobel Prize. And Denise says, I hope not soon. <laughs> I said, how can you, my wife, say something like that? And she said, you know, I've read about Nobel laureates. As soon as they get the Nobel Prize, they're intellectually dead. <laughs> <laughs> they get invited to round table discussions. They have dinners. And you, you still have many ideas. Play out your ideas lots of time to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so anyway, I heard on Yom Kippur, this is the mm -hmm. highest Jewish, Jewish holiday. holiday, five o'clock in the morning, the telephone rings, the telephone is on Denise's side of the bed, she answers it and she says, Eric, this is Stockholm calling, it must be for you, it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I heard. How about you, Professor Smosa, did you hear, were you at the same place when you were called and realized that both of you, or who got, who, who informed uh, the other one, how, how were he, how, how were you hit by the Nobel Prize? No, so what uh, happened uh, with us was that uh, we have a wonderful collaboration here in uh, Germany, in Munich, with Tobias Bornhofer. And Edward was on the way to, uh, to Munich. And I was uh, having a, a lab meeting, mm -hmm. which I love. And I uh, was discussing and discussing, and then I got this irritating phone call. <laughs> and I, I didn't know the number, and just, and then I thought, okay, uh, let me, <laughs> I, I, I just have to answer the phone. And um, then uh, he said, hi, this is uh, Jöran, and I said, oh, wow. I know him. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I was running to my office, and I was uh, sitting down, and then I, I said, okay, do you want me to, to tell about the new Nobel mm -hmm. laureate? Because I had no clue that it could mm -hmm. be Edward and me and, and John. So, and he said, no, you got it. And I, no, I don't believe it. <laughs> Send me an email because I don't believe my ears today. <laughs> <laughs> and then did you inform your husband or were you also? I, I was in a, a plane, so. Uh Nobody uh, could reach you. No, they tried at 10.30, I think, and uh, my plane landed 12.20, so then the whole world knew about it. I had, mm -hmm. didn't have a clue. And then I came out from the gate and was met by an airport representative with flowers. And uh, again, I had no clue what it was because I knew this was the time when they announced the prize, but it was totally out of my mind. And uh, then she didn't know what uh, the occasion was. Uh, so, but there was an airport car That's and we went surprising. together. It's also surprising, she knew something important had happened. Yeah, <laughs> but I started checking my phone mm -hmm. and then I saw, uh, in addition to some other several hundred messages, <laughs> there was uh, one from Jöran Hansen, whom mm -hmm. also I know, mm -hmm. uh, and then I sort of started suspected what, to mm -hmm. suspect what happened. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how much has 
life changed since I, I learned that the three of you have been old friends, you know each other for a long time, so you have a role model uh, <laughs> in Eric Kandel, but uh, December is not long ago. Can you continue to work as usual or are you now busy giving interviews, sitting in panels? Uh, you immediately luckily agreed to join the jury for the Eric Kandel New Scientists Prize, but is this uh, these kind of questions probably are being asked now all the time. I, I, yeah, we try to make some exceptions like this. This is very important. But uh, the main priority is to, uh, to continue to do science mm -hmm. as before. I mean, I'm very, very aware of uh, the concern that Denise had. So, uh, we, uh, I mean, I still think we have many years where we can do interesting science. So mm. uh, I think that's why we got the prize and that's what we have to do. Mm. Obviously the Nobel Prize has implications the whole world uh, seems to almost know about. But how do you view the importance of prestigious prizes in science as a whole? We are here today uh, to have two very prestigious prizes being awarded. In what way do they First of all, help with the work as if you are a scientist. Well, they help in many ways. Um, the university usually appreciates you, but appreciates you more after the Nobel Prize. Uh, just ever so slightly. <laughs> uh, it's just a wonderful recognition. I mean, uh, science is a wonderful occupation, and I enjoy my science now as much as they did before. In some ways, as you get older, you enjoy it even more. But there are many disappointments in science. Many experiments don't work, and it's a lot of hard work. So it's a wonderful reward. And I think most of us realize that the award is not simply for a single individual. It really represents a whole school, the students that worked with one, the teachers that taught one. So one sees it not as an award to you as an individual, but as you as a representative. Mm. Do you, you agree? Absolutely. Mm. But uh, so, 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 so one thing is that, you know, scientists, we are very egocentric because we do what we love. We live for mm -hmm. science. But then such prizes uh, let us tell the rest of the world the joy of science and to explore and to understand this and especially for us understand the mystery in our brain mm -hmm. and understand how we generate our thoughts and our memories and by getting this prize the rest of the society gets an eye opener wow this is exciting mm -hmm. so even in the in the kindergarten in norway people talk about the hippocampus mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> This leads me on to another question. Eric, uh, you have uh, a monthly TV show with Charlie Rose on, on American television, um, and you certainly have very much contributed to make science popular, also to stimulate young people to go into science. How important, uh, not just regarding prizes, how important is it that science gets brought out to the masses? How much do you view this as part also of your, how much is this a task you also set yourself? I think this is extremely important, and I've thought a lot about this. And almost from the beginning of my career, I've been interested in it. When I started to teach medical students, uh, I was struck with the fact that they would sit there and write down every single word you said as if there was a secretary taking notes. <laughs> um, and I decided I would give them a handout of what the lectures were about. Moreover, I was not the only person that taught the brain science course at Columbia or early at NYU. There were five or six other people that taught. And we rehearsed our lectures to make sure that what you say and what he says and what she says clearly understood to all of us. And those things are extremely helpful. I think it's very important. First of all, we have a responsibility to society that supports us to explain what the science is about. We also have a responsibility to our colleagues to explain what the science is about. I mean, we want not just to speak to the people who work in the hippocampus, we even want to speak to the people who work in the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> we want to speak to people outside of brain science to make it clear what this is about. So I think communication is extremely important. Mm -hmm. So is this also what convinced you to lend your name to the Young Neuroscientist Prize here 
with the Hattie Foundation? No, I was just so honored that this was happened. And I knew some of the leadership involved. I was very grateful for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So this was not to communicate signs that I had in mind, although this has that function. Mm -hmm. I accepted it because it was a great honor for me. Now, the, the Eric Kandel Young New Scientist Prize also states explicitly that it seeks to strengthen the European network of scientists. How important is this aspect to you as you live and work in the US? E extremely important. This has been my interactions with the Moses. Any scientist who has any social responsibility at all doesn't just worry about what it's like in Manhattan. I mean, they want to see science strengthened throughout the world. So even in Austria, that I have mixed feelings about, I now try to help them grow their scientific institutions. I'm on the advisory board for Easter and for another scientific institution. I think this is a moral responsibility we have to help science grow mm -hmm. throughout the developed world. Now, Peter Hegemann uh, said something very important about the nature of universities, and he had the example of Stanford, and uh, I would like to ask all three of you what you perceive to be the major difference in re methods of research or research possibilities between Europe and the US. What can we learn from one another? Because it sounded to me, it sounded as though the U.S. Uh, does have greater possibilities. Well, I think Europe is very uh, diverse, uh, uh, and, and so is the United States. So uh, I think mm. you, you actually have very strong neuroscience at many levels uh, at both places. But, uh, of course, quantitatively, the United States is so much bigger. So mm -hmm. I, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, tradition in Europe and also a lot of potential, so it's very important to strengthen that. Mm -hmm. They're in a very privileged position in Trondheim. This is not like a typical German university. Uh, if you compare a typical German university to Trondheim or to the United States, is a big comparison. Uh, after the Second World War, if I understand it correctly, German universities became extremely democratic. So they admitted many students. And the faculty spent most of their time teaching. You cannot do meaningful original research unless you have a lot of time to do this. And in most American universities, at Stanford, at Columbia, at Yale, at Harvard, you have to teach, obviously, but you also have a lot of time for yourself and good support to do that. You can't do science in three hours a week. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. You need to have time to think, to talk to people, in addition to doing experiments. And that, I gather, is difficult. The Max Planck saved science mm -hmm. in Germany. If it wasn't for the Max Planck, you would not have distinguished science in Germany. There are exceptions, but they're <laughs> rare. Uh, and I think the point that you made was absolutely right. One needs to re-examine the uh, research and scholarly opportunities at the German universities. Mm -hmm. How important are mentoring programs, which are also Part Fantastic. Of some All of us owe. They work with Perry Anderson, who is extraordinary. I had contact with Harry Grinfis. Mentoring on two levels. I also learned a great deal from my peers. When I started out, I happened to pick up a wonderful collaboration with a person my age, Alden Spencer. We taught each other an enormous amount. These two people, even though they're married, they taught each other a lot. <laughs> so I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think mentoring is extremely important at, at all levels. And uh, another example is that Eric has mentored us since we, this started, I'm, I don't know, 20 years ago or something like that. So, uh, so uh, there's yes, so and much. You both have dots on your ties, so this cannot be a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I got that from him. I saw their poster when they were graduate students, and I realized how outstanding they were. It was clear from the beginning that these were very special people. Mm -hmm. And one thing you didn't do, uh, May Britt, is it really disappointed me. Because I heard that when you heard that you got the Nobel Prize, you did a little dance. I did a dance, of course I did. <laughs> Would you mind doing that dance for us now? <laughs> Can you sing? <laughs> <laughs> Now you see what it's like to get to know about that. <laughs> and you have this wonderful dress, I believe, specially made with the grid cells had. for you because you had... I had the dress. I had given it to the university. Oh. 
<laughs> well, thank you very much. I would uh, ask you to stay here because uh, now uh, we come to the uh, Eric Kandel Young Neuroscientist yes. <laughs> Prize. Thank you very much, Ms. Okay. Moser. <laughs> <laughs>